Uh, my name is David Davido Profe. All my students just call me Profe. Yeah. Uh, so I've kind of adopted that nickname. What What is your name? Julie. Julie. Okay, very good. Julie, nice to meet you. Mm -hmm. And are okay. you teaching Spanish? I am. I teach translation interpretation. Oh, okay. Cool. Cool. Well, just to kind of get started, um, if you want to get your phone out and shoot me an email uh, with the subject conversational evaluation, that way we can stay in touch and I'll know that you attended my presentation today. Uh, my email address is david at thelanguageschool.us. And then, uh, of course, you can download this presentation from the, the conference's website. Um, and then here's my full contact information with cell phone and all my different social media links if you use social media at all. Um, so I, I typically like to start off Wait, just. Would you mind going back? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. So um, typically I like to start off and just kind of get a scan of the room to see who's in my audience. Uh, sounds like you're definitely a current teacher. Mm -hmm. um, other people that I like working with are teacherpreneurs. Uh, so what that essentially means is if you've ever considered starting like a private practice on your own to teach Spanish or ESL in your community, mm -hmm. uh, I'm really big on helping people kind of transition out of a formal, you know, educational institution situation to get into kind of that entrepreneurial spirit of, of teaching you how to make money by, by teaching languages and doing what you're passionate on your own, getting kind of financial freedom and independence. Um, so the, the topic of today is testing conversational proficiency. And I specifically started my own business to teach Spanish and English in my community because I felt like there was a really big gap in Denver. Uh, almost all of the programs um, essentially had the exact same approach to learning the language, right? Very academic, grammar-based, reading and writing, on paper type activities. And I went through that system, uh, two years of high school Spanish, uh, and then another two years of college Spanish, mm -hmm. and then s multiple immersion trips and eventually living down in Argentina. Mm -hmm. But it took me at least four, maybe five years to where I actually felt comfortable speaking Spanish, mm -hmm. despite the fact that I made straight A's. Mm -hmm. So for a very long time, hi, what's your name? Hi, Rebecca, Rebecca. I'm sorry. No, you're fine, Rebecca. Yeah, I was saying my, my only other participant is <laughs> It's somewhere around here. He said 50% of the group. <laughs> um, so Rebecca, where do you teach? I teach in Goodland, Kansas, right on, like oh right by the Colorado border. Oh, Good so I'm, I'm headed that's to Colorado right. tomorrow. Yeah. That's, that's where I came from. So. That's where when we see the weather reports, you know. So mm -hmm. uh, oh yeah, the National Weather land. Service. That's, really, that's, that's what we've got. Really <laughs> land. <laughs> and what, uh, what age group do you work with? Um, I teach 7 through 12. I'm in a 7-12 building and I'm the only Spanish teacher. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, and she's at the university level, so I've got a, a nice little mix here. Which university? Wichita State. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was just getting started and kind of sharing a little bit of my experience of having learned how to speak Spanish and kind of some of my frustrations where, you know, I really, on, I would go into tests and I would ace my tests and then I would go out and try to talk to somebody and just fail epically, right? You know? Um, so. After, you know, I've, I've studied all in all in about 10 different schools, and I, I had my most, I don't know, impactful moment when I was living down in Argentina. Uh, I studied one semester in Buenos Aires at a, at a Spanish immersion school, which was okay, you know, but then I went back to Cordoba, and it was just a completely different approach that I found in the school where, you know, they kind of broke things down into many concepts and then all we did was talk right and so that had a tremendous impact that's where I got my confidence right and it happened really fast <coughs> when I was in that right type of environment so I've always been a really big proponent of teaching conversational Spanish and conversational English because I believe that's what students really want you know they really want to learn how to speak the language reading writing grammar all super important right 
But if you look at kind of the way people learn their first language, they don't start off with that, you know? They start off understanding, then they start off being able to start producing words, right? Later, they get towards kind of kindergarten, they start learning how to read, then they start learning how to write, and then later still, they start learning the grammar. So I really wanted to do something different, you know? So I went out on my own, I started a business called The Language School in Denver, uh, and uh, according to Google and our star ratings, we are by far the top rated school in, in Denver. <laughs> um, so I, I think I'm on to something, right? And so I come to these conferences to try and share what I'm doing. Now I know I'm in a different position than a lot of you, right? You're, you're in the K-12 education system, you're in the college system, so what I'm going to talk about today may or may not work for you, but I'm hoping that you can at least have kind of an open mind and, and see what you can learn from it, right? Because I'm sure that um, it, it can have an impact if, if, if you take something away from it. So conversation classes are <coughs> practical. Um, that's why I do it. I've joked around for years with my students, you know, that come study with me. So what are you going to do when you walk into a bank? Are you going to write a note and hand it to the teller? Like, that's going to trigger all kinds of alarms. And I don't know if you saw this story, the director of the movie, Black Panther, got arrested in Atlanta when he walked in and handed a note to the teller. This was last year or the year before. It was during the pandemic, he's wearing his mask, right? Um, so from, from what I understand, he didn't feel comfortable, he was withdrawing a very large amount of money and he didn't feel comfortable saying that number out loud. He didn't want to call anybody's attention to it, right? So he goes into the bank and he hands this note over. It's all captured on video. And the teller triggers the alarm, like this guy in a mask is coming in and handing me a note. This is not gonna be good, right? But so apparently the teller didn't read the note, just hit the silent alarm. Police came, arrested him, locked him up, took him to the car, you know, and he started explaining, hey, I'm like, do you know who I am? I'm this incredibly famous person. I'm not robbing the bank. And he explained the situation and was eventually let go. So that's my sort, that's my joke I've been telling, and sure enough, it happened. So um, has anybody ever taught a group of students where you felt like some of the students were in the right level, but then there's a handful of students that are in the wrong level? Right? They're either way too advanced or they're, they're way below the level, right? So, yes? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes? You sir, yes? Yeah. So, um, it, that's a very big challenge for teachers to manage a class like that. At, at some degree, nobody's at the exact same level, right? So you're always going to have mixed level classes. Uh, some students are going to pick up the language faster than others, right? But uh, oftentimes, from, so in, in my practice, I receive students that have studied at other schools and they're all over the place, right? So um, I can share with you the, the story of Robin. He actually just came uh, on Monday to do an evaluation with me. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what I think is going on here and kind of my solution to the challenge to help place people into more accurate classes. Uh, I think you mentioned you kind of do the oral eval at the end of a course, yeah, right? So yeah. I'm, I'm kind of receiving students from all over the place, so I do it at the beginning and then throughout my classes, I'm also constantly testing their oral evaluations. Does anybody do an evaluation before your students sign up for your class or in your situation, it's Whoever, what levels do you teach? Um, intro at the junior high level and then one through four at the high school level. Okay, yeah. We um, do actually have a, a placement exam, but ironically, it's it's a it's a, an exam that they do online and it's all it's all written. Yeah. I mean, it's reading reading and grammar. Yeah. How about you, sir? <laughs> no, no, I don't do anything. Either. Okay. Cool. Um, so Robin, he's from Columbia, Robinson. <laughs> um, he was describing the situation, and this is a very common situation that I have, by the way. Uh, he was going to the local community college uh, that's not too far away from me, 
and he did their placement exam and he tested into level five out of six. So almost their top level of ESL classes, right? So according to the test that he did, he was an extremely advanced student. He's still going there because he already paid for the classes and he doesn't want to you know, miss out on what he paid for. But he came to me because he said, this isn't right. I don't, I feel overwhelmed. I'm not comfortable there. The teacher's talking about stuff and I don't understand what, what she's talking about, right? So through my conversational evaluation that I do with my students, he tested into the very first level. He does speak a little English, he's communicative, right? But he was essentially unable to introduce him and introduce himself in English in a really, in a, you know, I'm, as a language teacher, I kind of understand everything, right? <laughs> but I think the typical American might not understand him when he's trying to introduce himself. So this is the test that I gave him. And uh, I'm, I've actually got a couple of videos to show you of me doing the test with them. <coughs> see exactly how I do it. <coughs> but I do a rank system that I'm going to talk about in a little bit where the, uh, I ask questions and then I ask the student, I explain to them before that we sit down and take the test that it's important to answer me with full complete sentences, right? Using the verb because that's the primary kind of conversational exchange that I'm trying to evaluate, right? So my three systems of ranking are three for a perfect answer, meaning pronunciation was pretty understandable, and essentially the grammar was exactly the way it should be, you know? And that's why I, I insist on those full complete sentences. Uh, two means it's, it's okay, right? I think most people would understand it. Something's wrong. Maybe he missed the right verb conjugation. Maybe he missed the accompanying preposition. Something was missing, but it was still fairly basic, <coughs> right? A number one means he understands the question, but he's unable to produce a complete answer in response to the question, right? And then a zero just means flat out, he doesn't even understand, right? So this person tested into five out of six. What's my first question? How are you? How are you? When I insisted that he give me a complete answer, he could not do it. He could only answer good. How are you? Good. I even give a little prompt. Okay, in Espanol, pero como se dice yo estoy bien? Uh, I good? No, 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 yo estoy. How do you say estoy? You're not saying the, like, the key component, right? So he couldn't do that. Um, yet he's in an advanced English class at the community college, right? We got a few twos in there. Uh, he couldn't spell his name. He got most of the letters right, but he confused the I with the E, right? Which is pretty common because if you speak Spanish, right, our, our, uh, their I is pronounced like our E, right? So the, these are the types of things that I'm listening for. Um, now, as we kind of go through this, you know, you can see that I'm starting off with it extremely simple. This is, this is my very first level of English that I teach, what I call Foundations 1. So that's what these, these uh, letters mean on the left-hand side. But you can see it's all simple present tense. Uh, we're starting off with pretty common questions that you might get asked, making small talk. What do you do for work? I get this a lot. People either don't even understand what that question means, right? They, they hear the what do you do, which in Spanish you would say que haces, right? Que haces, so, but where we use the present progressive in English, they use the simple present tense in Spanish, and it's confusing for people. They say, oh, I'm talking to you, <laughs> right? What do you do for work? And then I get to the next one, what do you do for fun, you know? And he, they're broken answers, right? They're really broken answers. My suspicion, and I think you actually already alluded to it, right, is that the local community college is doing a test like this, where there's no real interaction with the prospective student, right? They either do it online, or they do go and they do it in person, and they're filling in blanks for the, uh, uh, for the most part, right? And I know this too because my students tell me this, and this is on their website. Right? Um, so what, 
what's wrong with this evaluation? <coughs> and I, you know, I, I don't mean to be critical, but it's, it's my belief that something is really missing from this evaluation, from this, from this placement test. Does anybody want to take a stab at it? Well, it's not communicational at all. Very good. It's not communicational at all. Any, any other comments about why you think that it might not be a good evaluation? That's not how we communicate. Right? Again, communication, I guess I'm just putting back on. It's not that. natural. Like, that's not real world language use. It is not. Very good. What about you, sir? No, I mean, this seems to be more written to than conversation. Absolutely. Yeah, it is. Complete, almost, almost grammar. Right, well, we're talking about I mean, we've got different exactly. verb tenses where they have to know the yeah. past participle. I think you just actually hit the nail on the head there, right? So if we look up here, it says it here. It's measuring proficiency and using correct grammar. Yeah, yeah, right. Languages are really complex. Grammar is a big part of it, right? But there's so much more to a language when it comes to effective communication. Now, the only thing that they're testing for is grammar on a test like this. Um, I'm gonna move on. There's some other things that I'll, I'll, I'll talk about as well, too, in a minute. But this is another one that they give to students where, they, where the student gets to perform their own self-evaluation. Now, it's in, it's in English. Imagine being someone that speaks Arabic, <coughs> that's not even familiar with our alphabet. <coughs> when they take this test, they're just going to guess their way through it, right? And if they don't understand the difference between I read for pleasure and for work, always or rarely, maybe they just pick the first answer they see, right? It's and, a test of reading comprehension. Yeah. And so then they show this to the, you know, the, the people that's do, administrating the evaluation who gets it. It's like, oh, wow, this person's really good with their English. And the person has no idea what they actually just filled out. <laughs> so um, I think they're flawed, right? Uh, here's a quote I got from the AP Central College Board org. Why test conversation? Most, research, uh, most researchers agree that multiple choice items are poor tools for measuring the ability to synthesize and evaluate information or apply knowledge to complex problems or solve problems. Who thinks that learning a new language is not a complex problem, <laughs> right? It's an extremely complex problem. Yet here in the year 2022, as far as I know, most community colleges are still giving out multiple choice exams, right? So multiple choice <coughs> evaluations are not accurate. You can use your way to a higher level. Also, it's easier to read and write a new language than it is to speak it. You know, for, for most people, I think, because of that effective filter, if you know about the Krashen's hypothesis on the effective filter, which I think is the most brilliant piece of his work that he's done. I love, I love the effective filter. A lot's going on when you're speaking, right? You're activating all the different parts of your brain. And naturally, if you haven't gone through this process enough time, your anxiety is way up there, right? I mean, I've, I've seen people that are literally trembling when, they, when, I, when I do this conversational evaluation with them, which is, you know, I always have to tell them, relax, you know, we're just hanging out, having a cup of coffee, we're two friends, having a good time, having a conversation. <coughs> This is just to make sure that you get into the process, right? <coughs> now, that nervousness, when it comes to actually interacting with a new person, that's not there when you're reading and writing. You have more time to process what you're reading. And then, especially if you're coming from like a, a romance language background, English 